Hi everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Bobby. It's Wednesday. That means it's time for a new episode of Weird History. You never knew. You need to know. On today's episode, we are going to talk about the Vatican and the Catholic Church and how they may have aided the Nazis during World War II. This story, you guys, is another really weird one. This was one of those that I, I heard about and I thought, this can't really be true. So I did what I do best, and that is doing a deep dive. And the stuff I found, you guys, was pretty disturbing. But before we get too far into today's video, I did want to stop and remind you that if you like this kind of content, please be sure to hit the like button. And if you are not already a subscriber, please be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you're notified every time I upload new content. Okay, let's get back to the video. We're going to start today's story with Pope Pius XI. Pope Pius XI was the Pope and head of the Catholic Church from February 6th, 1922 to February 10th, 1939. His papacy actually lasted until his death. When the Nazi party first began to grow in Germany, Pope Pius XI was definitely not a fan of the Nazi party, and he actually opposed German members of the Catholic Church to join the Nazi party and become part of it. However, the Pope's mind slowly began to change after Adolf Hitler began to rise to power. He had kind of a, a weird change of heart, and he was even quoted as saying, I have changed my mind about Hitler. It is for the first time that such a government voice has been raised to denounce Bolshevism in such categorical terms, joining with the voice of the Pope. So the Catholic Church was very opposed to Bolshevism or communism. Even though the Nazi party was not great, it also strongly opposed Bolshevism. So there was kind of a natural alignment of that shared belief between Hitler and the, or between the Nazi party and the Pope. So the Pope kind of started to change his tune and kind of be a bit more um, sympathetic or have a bit more patience for the Nazi party and Hitler. So the Nazi party took over Germany in 1933. And when this happened, in addition to seeing the mistreatment of the Jewish people in Germany and Poland, there was also the sporadic persecution of Catholic Germans in Germany. Obviously, this isn't going to sit well with the Pope. The Pope is becoming very concerned. And so what he wanted to do was he wanted to send someone that could talk to either Hitler or a representative of Hitler to kind of get on the same page and to open up the lines of communication. Pope Pius XI sent Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli to go negotiate or try to negotiate with the Nazis. And something interesting to keep in mind is that Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli became the next Pope. He was next in line and he actually became Pope Pius XII. So we are going to definitely circle back to Pope Pius XII because this story has more to do with him than Pope Pius XI, but I just want to give you this background so you understand the history and where we're going with the story. The meeting between the Cardinal and the Nazi party resulted in an agreement called the Reich Concordant. And what that agreement was is it included um, certain protections for the Catholic Church. Some of those protections it included was a guarantee of liberty for the Catholic Church, independence for Catholic organizations and youth groups, and then also the right to teach children in school. So the Nazi party agreed to this, but before the ink was even dry on the paper, they were already violating the Reich's Concordant. There were quite a few violations, and this made Pope Pius XI incredibly uneasy. Obviously, he was very worried about the church's relationship with the Nazi party, with the Germans, how that would look. The other thing that was going on, too, is that we have to understand that Vatican City is in Rome. It's in Italy. And so in addition to being the leader of the Catholic Church and the leader of Vatican City, the Pope also had to work with Mussolini, who was the fascist leader of Italy at the time. And Mussolini found kind of an, he was kind of inspired by Hitler. And he really wanted to partner up with Hitler. And so Mussolini pulled the Italians into the war. Because Mussolini had a close relationship with Hitler, this put the Pope in a really precarious situation because the Pope had to be somewhat careful about the public stances that he took and what he could say. 
But it was following the events of Crystal Knock that Pope Pius XI completely changed his tune. He joined Western leaders in condemning what the Nazi party was doing to the Jewish people. After Crystal Knock, Pope Pius XI, he's showing resistance to the Nazi cause. He opposes the idea that there is a supreme Aryan race, and he's, he's done. He has just decided, like, this is not going well. But on February 10th, 1939, Pope Pius XI suffered three heart attacks in very quick succession, and then he ended up passing away. This is where things start to take a very dark turn in regards to the Vatican and the Catholic Church's involvement during World War II. So you remember we were just talking about the Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli. He became the next Pope and he was officially appointed the Pope of the Catholic Church on March 2nd, 1939, where he would remain the Pope for almost 20 years until his death. So Pope Pius XII already has a relationship with the Nazis. He has already been to different meetings. He was part of the Rex Concordant, and he had a very amicable relationship with the Nazi party and Mussolini's fascist party. There is a book that I read in researching this topic, and it's called The Pope at War. It's by David Metzler, and I would highly, highly encourage you to check out this book. I got so much amazing information out of this book, and it talks about a lot of fairly recently declassified documents from the U.S. government, and it is shocking. So I would, if you find this interesting, I would definitely encourage you to check out that book. This book discusses Pope Pius XII's relationship and the things that he was doing during the war. So during the war, he was very concerned for a few different reasons. Number one, he was very concerned about religion being pushed out of Europe. And it wasn't so much, I think, that he was concerned about people not knowing like the truth of the Catholic religion, but I really think what it was, was it was a, a maintenance of power. They wanted to maintain power. And the Pope knew that if religion was kind of pushed by the wayside, as it would be through something like Bolshevism or communism, it would really impact the power of the Catholic Church. So he knew that he needed to maintain whatever power he could at all costs. So the tactic that he took was basically never taking a hard stance ever, one way or the other in regards to the conflict. He would make these statements. So people would expect the church or the Pope to come out with these statements that one way or the other um, clearly defined how the Catholic Church stood in regards to World War II, but Pope Pius XII never did that. And he was an expert at writing speeches. What he would do is he would write these incredibly vague speeches that if you were a Nazi, you could interpret it as being supportive to the Nazi party, but if you were not, if you were aligned with the Allies, then it could potentially be interpreted as an alignment with the Allies. So he was very tricky in that way, and he never wanted to take a definitive stance one way or the other. Pius XII referred to it as keeping the church visible, but really what he was doing was trying to maintain the power of the Catholic Church. So in an effort to better leverage his position, Pius XII thought it might be a good idea to work with Hitler and to see if they can find some, I don't know if you could call it common ground, but um, to communicate and to see if they could find some way to work together, essentially. And that is where Philip von Hessen comes in. Philip von Hessen was a German who came from a very prominent family. His grandfather was a German emperor, and his great-grandmother was Queen Victoria of Great Britain. Von Hessen married Princess Mafalda, whose father was King Victor Emmanuel. So this guy comes from a very connected, noble family, and he has connections. And one of the connections that he has is to Germany's Fuhrer, Hitler. Von Hessen joined the Nazi stormtroopers and very, very quickly became incredibly close to Hitler. So close, in fact, that Hitler actually trusted von Hessen to go meet with Pope Pius XII to have secret meetings, and he was the intermediary. He went in between Hitler and Pius XII and sent messages back and forth. So the Pope was in constant communication with Hitler during this time, and people were not aware of it because it was all going through von Hessen. As things started to change during World War II, and as the Nazis were suffering huge losses, it became apparent that the Nazi party was 
potentially going to be in a lot of trouble. There were numerous crimes against humanity, war crimes that were committed. And so a lot of these higher ups and these officers in the Nazi party knew that when this all came to an end, which it was looking like it was coming to an end because the allies were coming from the West and the Red Army, the Russians were coming from the East and they were about to capture Berlin. They knew that this was not going to end well. And so what the Nazi party wanted to do was to establish escape routes so that these Nazi war criminals could get out of Germany and stay alive and survive and not be captured by either the Allies or the Red Army. These escape routes that I'm talking about are referred to as rat lines and they were kind of they were kind of throughout Europe and it was really interesting because it wasn't just one escape route. So there were some Nazis that escaped to Switzerland and South America or Austria, but the majority of these rat lines led these people that were defectees essentially to South America. Argentina was incredibly sympathetic to the Nazi plight and there are actually German cities that were established in Argentina during and after World War II. And in these cities, it is amazing. These people speak German. The construction of their homes is Bavarian. It's, it is like a completely German town and these still exist to this day. I did talk about this in a little more detail in my video, The Death of Hitler. So I'll go ahead and link that up above and you can check that out if you're interested in more information about that. So we have these established escape routes out of Europe to get these Nazi war criminals moved out. And this is where the Roman Cardinal Luigi Maglioni comes in. Allegedly at the behest of Pope Pius XII, Maglioni reached out directly to the ambassador of Argentina to see how sympathetic they would be to the Nazi cause. And they were sympathetic. This allowed many, many Germans to actually live and work in Argentina. And this Cardinal Maglioni, he was responsible for obtaining the documents that these people would need to escape. So he would help them obtain false passports, false papers, false documents, different IDs for false identities so that they could escape. And this is information that has only come out within probably the last like five years or so. This is information that was kept very hidden, especially by the Vatican, because they didn't want this information getting out. Because obviously it's terrible. This is such a bad look. Why would the Vatican want to get involved and help these people escape? And the only thing that I can think of is that it comes back to that maintaining that power. It comes back to, um, you know, it's like doing someone a favor and they owe you. It, it gives them power. It shifts the power back to the Vatican. So in doing all my research, I asked myself, okay, well, if all of this was going on, what was the U.S. doing? Was the U.S. aware? Was the U.S. involved? I mean, Clearly, our government could not be involved in participating in the escape of these war criminals that they're trying to prosecute in Nuremberg, right? No, not right. Wrong. So let's talk about the U.S.'s involvement in this whole scheme and the rat lines. A declassified U.S. intelligence report from 1950 talks about a specific rat line that was actually used by the United States government and central intelligence. The specific rat line was called the Draganovich rat line. And the way that the U.S. posed this is the U.S. claimed that they had visitors that were in Austria and it would not look favorable if these U.S. visitors were found in Austria after the war. So they reached out to Maglioni to have these visitors use the rat lines to escape to Argentina. So who were these visitors, right? Are they U.S. citizens? Well, this is where Operation Paperclip comes into play. This one blew my mind. So the U.S. was involved in working with the Vatican to procure documents 
to get some visitors from Germany into Argentina. And some of these visitors specifically were people that had been tried at Nuremberg. And they were prisoners. They were not sentenced to death, but they were sentenced to prison terms. Germany is wanting this whole thing to be over. They're wanting the oversight of the Allies out of their country. And so the Allies decide to make a deal. And they knew that Russia was scooping up the Nazi party's top talent. So they were they were pulling people that were physicians, people that were scientists, um, people that were, and we're talking like astrophysicists. Russia was pulling these people out of Germany that were convicted war criminals and they were recruiting them to work for their space program. And they were just utilizing all of those resources and those talents. And the US, not wanting to be at the disadvantage, decided that they were going to essentially do the same thing. And so a lot of these visitors that they helped escape from Germany through Austria and then to Argentina were people that were very high up in the Nazi party because of what they did. So these were people who had scientists, these were people who were physicians, these were people who had a lot of experience and expertise in something very specific and very special. And what the US military did is it brought those people here to the US to work for the US government as free citizens. Werner von Braun was one of these people. He was a rocket scientist and he was almost like a wonderkins. Like he was a, someone who at a very young age really understood this type of science and was incredibly successful. And he was a part of the Nazi party and he committed crimes and he was convicted. And he was then taken out of prison and brought to the United States where he was actually the head of our NASA space program. And there's this interesting picture that you can see with the Von Braun sitting next to JFK Jr. I need to jump in here really quick and make a correction. The picture that I was referring to is not Werner Von Braun. It was actually Kurt DeBus. He also worked with NASA and he was also a Nazi engineer. And Von Braun has this massive scar on his face. And what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of these prominent Nazis have these big scars on their faces. And what they are is they're called dueling scars. And essentially it's like a Nazi fight club. They were brought up to learn sword fighting and fencing. And it was a badge of honor to wear one of these scars because it showed it showed who you were. It showed what you were a part of. It showed how tough you were and how you were brought up. And it's interesting because if you look through a lot of American history, you will see many Germans with this very long scar, these dueling scars. And these were people that were taken from prison and brought to the U.S. because of their special talents and allowed to live normal, productive lives out in society. All because the U.S. government and military wanted to capitalize on their unique skills and education without regard to the crimes that these people committed and what they did. And Operation Paperclip, it's very disturbing and it's it's it was so surprising. I had no idea that this was a thing, but I can assure you it most definitely is. Operation Paperclip was responsible for taking um, at least 1,600 Nazi criminals, which were scientists, engineers, technicians, and brought them to the U.S. 1,600 people were freed because of this Operation Paperclip to come to the U.S. and to work. Operation Paperclip was conducted between 1945 and 1959, and it was conducted by the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, as well as the U.S. Army's Counterintelligence Corps. So this was, this was very much run by the military and the government. They very much knew what they were doing, and it was a lot of people. It was 1,600 people that they, that they freed. And the only way that Operation Paperclip was made successful and actually worked was because of the cooperation of the Catholic Church and the Vatican, and with the support of Pope Pius XII. So I want to know, what do you guys think about all of this? Do you have any opinions one way or the other? I think that this is so interesting, and it's so crazy how many things happen that we don't know about that's not shared publicly, and it's kind of disturbing because I think a lot of this stuff we should probably know about. I want to thank you so much for joining me on today's video. If you like this kind of content, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up on your way out. And also, if you are not yet subscribed, 
please be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you know every time I upload new content. Thank you so much for spending your time with me to learn a little more weird history that you never knew that you need to know. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye.